today we are going to discuss the second half of the prenatal diagnosis lecture. And last time we discussed the basics of screening and an outline of the test which we have for identifying uh, problem patients prenatally. So today we are going to go deep into the screenings of prenatal conditions. So what we are going to learn is a little bit about what we aim to do in prenatal diagnosis, the benefits of it and there are certain risks associated with it. Then the method available for screening of chromosomal aneuploidies, which is the mainstay of prenatal diagnosis at the moment. And then we will comparatively discuss advantages and disadvantages of each method. And then we come to the confirmation. Now, after offering a screening test, we need to screen patients for or confirm the diagnosis whether they are having an aneuploidy like trisomy 21 or Down syndrome or uh, Edward syndrome. To that, do that, we have certain diagnostic or confirmatory tests, and then how to approach a couple basically, how to handle a request for Down syndrome screening. So, that part we will cover and then briefly cover. Uh, the nitty-gritty of these details. So, what do we really do by offering prenatal diagnosis to our patients? We know that uh, most of the things which are done in advanced countries cannot be done like terminations. But still, uh, if we identify the pregnancy early and tell that uh, uh, come to a conclusion whether the pregnancy is incompatible with life or have age or disability. The parents might, if they have the, the means of doing it, might wish to go for termination. Though it is not legally possible in Sri Lanka, some people might even go to India or any other country where things can be done officially, and which is legally allowable. So, it is not the reason for us to withhold the prenatal diagnostic test. Of course, if they don't like to consider termination, then it is a different matter. Still, there are other reasons why we should offer prenatal diagnosis. We can identify conditions which we can influence the timing of the delivery, site of the delivery, or the place where we deliver, rather than delivering in a district general hospital, delivering them at a tertiary care hospital with adequate neonatal. Uh, care and pediatric surgical care facilities where we can sometimes rectify, say, like neural tube defects or a baby with a cardiac defect where they can be offered surgery quickly after this or diagnosing a duodenal latresia, which might end up with death if it happens in a resource poor setting, but if it is occurring in a tertiary hospital we can offer the, uh, the mother a better outcome for her baby. Then, sometimes we may not be able to treat them, but pediatric interventions in early life, say like uh, renal uh, pelvis dilatation, which, was, which is diagnosed in pregnancy, can help the pediatricians to decide on screening the baby in the neonatal period and the post-neonatal period for better outcomes so that they can follow the patient. And then some babies might really be possible to treat in utero like uh, recess isoimmunization. If we can identify them prenatally, it may be possible to offer treatment or twin to twin transfusions if we can identify early and treat. So it doesn't mean that only Down syndrome screening is available for prenatal diagnosis. It's a vast area as we discussed in the last lecture. And all, all of the interventions which can be done in utero will benefit from prenatal diagnosis. 
and then additional benefits like reassuring the parents and counseling and sometimes reassuring women who may not really take up pregnancy is also beneficial otherwise they will avoid pregnancy completely fearing that they have uh, gone beyond a certain limit in their life and can go for pregnancy say somebody who is in early 40s might not wish to go for pregnancy but if we have prenatal diagnostic screening and diagnostic testing we can still offer them a chance to have their own babies rather than adopting because with that we can exclude the possibility of a normal baby at least with regard to trisomy 20. If some abnormality is detected we can offer them further testing referral to a, for additional counseling and opinions and then whether we can continue the pregnancy or terminate pregnancy or prepare the parents for a baby who is having special needs say somebody who is not going for termination for down syndrome might even start getting ready with the additional resources for the arrival of the baby and even our obstetric management can be changed and obviously we need to be aware about facilities for neonatal management. Of course, nothing comes free without any downside. There are some downsides of prenatal diagnostic testing. Commonest problem is when we do a test until the results come or even after the results, if we suspect something abnormal, the parents will be in pains. They will be anxiously waiting and then worry. Some, like all tests, all these tests also have false positives, false negatives and sometimes real true positive rate may be low so when you're offering a test you need to be very clear about the false positive rate false negative rates the sensitivity specificity of these tests and what comes after false positive screening tests or, or positive screening test with regard to the baby and then occasionally when we do interventions say like amniocentesis the baby might end up with termination or abruptions or and other complications so the test itself may be harmful so we need to be very careful with that right now we come to the screening for chromosomal aneuploidies which actually is the bulk of prenatal diagnostic testing offered for patients in our country at the moment but it doesn't mean that we cannot screen for structural anomaly so we cannot screen for genetic single low multiple gene abnormalities prenatal screening for aneuploidy is done mainly to identify a woman having a risk of carrying a fetus with common fetal aneuploidies. Most of the time it's trisomy 21, 18 or 30. Compared to diagnostic testing for genetic abnormalities, where we test for chromosomal uh, Uh, the chromosomal number variations, deletions or duplications. Here we are actually uh, at looking for mainly the, the, the abnormal dosages of chromosomes or the number of chromosomes which are there in the baby. For that we look at maternal serum, certain early anatomical features on ultrasound as well as other uh, fetal DNA from the maternal serum as well. There are a wide variety of tests and most of the time before offering a test we need to have a good discussion and counseling with the patient 
and when we are doing the test we need to make sure that they are informed about the positives as well as negatives of all these things and you need to take into account the patient's circumstances from their economic background their value systems their interests whether they really want to know everything about the baby or whether they just want to get reassured that the baby is okay or oh, and what their goals are say whether they want to have a perfect baby and plan for everything some like some people do or oh, whether just they just want to have some reassurance and a little bit of information but they will never consider aborting the baby if that is the case you need to have a clear idea before offering a test because after offering a test you will be confusing them as well as yourself why are they important the aneuploidies they are the commonest inherited congenital conditions which affect the babies in the long run apart from the structural abnormalities structural abnormalities are still common say cardiac defects probably is the number one abnormality among the babies but out of the inherited conditions trisomies or aneuploidies are the number one especially down syndrome is the most common inherited uh, chromosomal disorder of the human so we need to uh, see and when we are uh, discussing uh, chromosomal abnormalities we need to tell the parents that when a chromosomal abnormality is there that might result the baby being dying inside they may not even survive the pregnancy even after the pregnancy is over after the delivery they might not die if they survive until so that means most of the first trimester abortions may be related to that even if they survive they may end up having certain congenital abnormalities may have growth problems they have some functional disabilities they may not be fertile and they may not have the normal life span like trisomy patients they will high, barely go beyond the 6th or 5th or 6th decade of their life some chromosomal abnormalities are rare but the overall we tell that one in 150 live births might have some chromosomal abnormalities chromosomal uh, aneuploidies generally increases with age and though the risk of somebody having chromosomal abnormality is higher as they get older it doesn't mean that younger patients don't get it actually the, the the highest number of trisomy babies or 21 babies or down syndrome babies get delivered by women who are younger there are other risk factors for apart from the age for uh, any plagues the commonest uh, one is previous baby affected with any plague say down syndrome if you have somebody uh, in the family then your risk depends on whether you have a translocation downs or uh, non disjunctional downs majority of down syndromes are occurring because of the non disjunction that is mainly age related but if it is a translocation downs then the risk is high and you need to calculate the risk based on the the pedigree chart sometimes you might end up having doubts because of the somatic mosaism so a doubts baby is not straight forward as you have go learned in your pediatrics it is a complex presentation due to three separate components so 
each separate component when it is translocation or with the sorbitic mosaicism or non disjunction the risk of recurrence depends. So, if somebody has some uh, previously affected baby, you need to really send them for, of course, for genetic counseling before seeing them again. Other conditions like client filter, again, it's not that uncommon. One in 500 males get affected with 47XX1. Turner syndrome or the monosomy uh, X is the only viable sex chromosomal uh, monosomy in the humans. Age is the, as we, we said that age is the commonest risk factor for uh, aneuploidies. You can see that say at age of 25 risk of Down syndrome is having a Down's baby is 1 in 1300. At that age, having any abnormality, including Downs, Turner's, Trisomy 13 or Patton syndrome, uh, and even other rare abnormalities. The overall figure is 1 in 400. So, 1 in 500, close to 1 in 500, still will have some abnormality. But to be it to be Downs, the risk is uh, half of that, 1 in 1,300, or 1 in one third. But when they reach the age of 35, you can see the risks are now watery. Down syndrome risk is 1 in 350. Any chromosomal abnormality risk at 35 is 1 in 178, 1 in 200. When they come to 40 years, Is astronomically high, you can see 1 in 85. So, yeah, 1 out of 85 women at the age of 40 will have carried out baby. 1 in 62 of women of that age will carry some abnormal, a baby with some abnormal chromosomes. It may not be Downs, but something else. So, risk is when they come to 45, you can see 1 in 35 will carry a doubt. 1 in 18 women of 45 having pregnancy out of 18 of them, 1 will have abnormal. Risk increases as they come down in age. So, this chart you need to have it. Uh, access it is available in most of the um, online search engines. If you have a patient who needs education, you need to go through this chart that me explain. I'm not going into detail uh, about Down syndrome. You will learn that in neonatology and pediatrics. But they have facial abnormalities, difficulties in learning, and then structural defects, commonly associated AV canal defects or VSDs. Uh, they have intestinal atresias, epilepsy-like features, childhood leukemias, and early onset Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Those are the common problems with trisomy. And majority of Down's babies will never see the light of delivery, even if we don't do anything. About 40% will end in miscarriage and stillbirth. Majority will actually happen in the first trimester. In developed countries, with all the advanced facilities, they can live almost up to 60 years. But in our setup, rarely beyond 50. There are certain conditions which increases, as I said earlier, the mother's age, pre previous uh, parents having translocation, previous sibling or brother or sister having trisomies. Other ultrasound soft markers, they are called soft markers, which we will discuss in the next lecture where ultrasound screen is taken. They can increase the risk of the baby having it, and any screening test coming positive.
after the diagnosis of trisomy or Down syndrome or whatever, it doesn't tell you whether the baby is having all of the previously mentioned abnormalities or only one or two. So the diagnosis itself it will not tell us the prognosis of the baby. To come to a good assessment of the prognosis, we need to repeat and scan the baby and see for other complications as well as observe the baby after the delivery. So the diagnosis is not all inclusive. So some patients may have different outcomes. Some babies may have only minor infection. Their intellectual ability is normal. Only the facial defects are there. Some people will have almost normal looking faces, but will have some serious cardiac abnormal. So it's the presentation might differ. There are also genetic backgrounds uh, for those things. I'm not going into detail, but if you're interested to read a little bit more about Down syndrome uh, on your free time. As I mentioned earlier, though age is the most important factor, majority of Down babies will be delivered by young women. In one study, uh, women of 35 and above, about 38,000 were studied. In that study, about 21% probably had Down babies. But practically, we know, because younger women deliver more babies than compared to women about 35, majority of Downs will be from mothers who are below 35. Right. Now we come to the practical part of Down syndrome screen. What to do when somebody asks you to test it? So this is the general process of screen. You have high risk patients or whether they are interested on Down syndrome knowledge or based on their previous history like previous miscarriages, previous affected baby or the age of about 35 or whatever, they want to know. So you discuss the options of screen, whether see them screening, ultrasound screening or non-invasive screening tests or fetal DNA. You discuss and what will happen if a test is negative, what will happen if the test is positive. And then you do the screening test. You can do a single test at the first time and in the first trimester, or you can do several tests in sequence or sequential testing. That means you do certain one part of the test in the first trimester and the second part in the second trimester. They have higher sensitivity, but the risk of having a lot of anxiety, generating a lot of anxiety and waiting for another test in the Second trimester is a downside. And then after the result, you do post test counseling. If they are negative, you can say, you can't reassure they, they've completely seen that they will not never have a baby. All these tests will give you a figure of probability. So you can explain them the chance of them having a baby is less, but still it is possible. And if it is a positive test, you need to tell them what we need to do with regard to the diagnosis or confirmatory test. So the confirmatory tests are usually amniocentesis and sometimes if they are early enough we might offer them chorionuclear sampling. So you need to arrange for those things and then again after the sample from the fetal amniotic cells or chorionuclear is obtained you need to send them across for genetic testing chromosomal culture and karyotyping or PCR testing or straight away for fish or fluorescent inside to hybridize different tests. So you need to learn or revisit your molecular bi biology or genetics lectures and see the diagnostic tests which we can do to any genetic material taken from the pregnancy. Have a idea about karyotyping fish testing and what a PCR is. In your molecular uh, chemistry days, or genetics lectures, you may have heard and I will try to provide you with some links in the 
additional reading material. And after confirmatory testing, after say karyotype or fished report, you will have a good idea whether the, the baby carries thumbs up. If it is positive, then you need to go for another post test. Sometimes people may have a decadue test, but their background history may be very high. In those cases, you may have to uh, continue to monitor them. You may not be doing any screening test again, but at least look for other abnormal markers with the ultrasound. And in ultrasound, sometimes you might see uh, abnormality of the heart on anomaly scale. In that case, you need to reassess the baby again for a possibility of having Down syndrome or any other trisomies, and then take it from there. Sometimes you may have to go for confirmatory testing but with amniocentesis again. It depends. Right. These are the principles of uh, pre and post test counseling. You need to gather information about the background of the parents, what is their risk, age-wise, background family history-wise, and then tell them about the disease condition, what is Down syndrome, how it comes about, what are the things we are going to look for, and then how it is diagnosed and confirmed, and then what happens afterwards, and what a normal patient, parent with the baby might do. So, you need to have a good idea what the options the parents are considering if it happens to be a positive baby. Always promote autonomous decision making. You are not forcing your decisions down the patient's throat. Assess whether they are psychologically disabled. Sometimes they may be prone to go into depression or they may have a background of psychological instability. In that case, you may get the help of psychiatric team. So discuss with your seniors and arrange for psychological assessment prior to offering this. As always, and almost everything in medicine, we are not dictating. It has to be non-directive. Let empower the patients, but don't be directive that you should do this. They might ask you, doctor, what will you do if you are the patient? You have to always refrain from answering that question. You need to tell what I will do is different, but in your case, it is better for you to decide on your own. Other uh, available options, and then you need to tell them about the two types of tests, screening test versus diagnostic test, limitations of screening test, detection rate or positivity rate, negativity rate, how many weeks or days are taken for results to come. What we will do, we will do to expedite the process so whether it is not possible. And if the results are available early enough, whether it is possible for them to consider termination, even if it is not available officially, whether they can. And always tell them that having discussed all these things, they are not bound to go for testing. They can still withhold or refrain from going for testing. So, no testing is another option. Always explore their background, family structure, other children, whether they have the partners who are supporting, with how the extended family is feeling about them. So, gather all the information you can to them. In other countries, there are specially trained counsellors who will do only these Test. especially it's most of the time it's a nurse practitioner who does the counseling they have enough time to go with the patient and analyze before offering the test and you need to direct them to uh, web material if they can read english materials are available widely on the web if they cannot then their choices are limited but still you can offer them good advice and always ask them to think what they will do if the test is positive after the result. 
how to relieve anxiety after negative results or positive results or while waiting for this you need to help them to come to that. And even if they don't go for uh, termination, they need to be ready for special need baby. So if the baby dies while in pregnancy or outside, what to expect and what to do. As I mentioned, all this consider a little bit of psychological assessment. So, before the test, go through all the things which we mentioned earlier and then give them an estimate of their risk. So, pre-test counseling ends with giving them possibility of having downs is higher or lower kind of a risk estimate and then offer you a uh, screening test. After the screening test, again you adjust your uh, the estimation of the risk and then you offer them the diagnostic test. And after the diagnostic test, again your risk of positive or negative results need to be adjusted depending on the test results, whether the baby is having higher likelihood or higher chance of having a Down's baby or not. And then you need to counsel about the outcomes and chance of them having a quality life with the kind of aneuploid or chromosomal abnormality, whether they are how to adapt themselves for the, the special care baby at the time of delivery as well as after the delivery, where they are going to deliver the baby, are they going to deliver in a place where they can. Uh, they are close to or they should go to a tertiary center in, outside their residence for delivery. We don't have uh, perinatal hospitals, where, especially when the baby is really not capable of having a normal life will, but will live say six months after the delivery. In those uh, certain countries they have what you call a perinatal hospice like a cancer hospice where patients who are not completely curable but still under some treatment to have extend their lifespan, they are kept in cancer hospices. Same way, perinatal hospices are available for mothers with babies who are really fairly incapable and will not have a normal lifespan until their birth. They are, given death, uh, they are given care, where the, the baby's long-term viability is very poor. And sometimes you may have to send them across again for special genetic counseling if the parents request it, especially when there are con complex scenarios, it is better for you to offer them genetic counseling. Now we come to the methods available for prenatal diagnosis. No. It's a large battery of tests. There are screening tests which are generally non-invasive. There are diagnostic tests which are invasive. Screening tests, you have three categories. You can do ultrasound scanning. In the first trimester itself, you can do early second trimester or uh, late first trimester anomaly scanning. Different from the anomaly scanning which we offer at 18 to 24 weeks, this is an early anomaly scanning. You can do nuclear translucence, actually it is part of the screening test for first trimester, nuclear translucence. To interpret the test, you need to have nuclear because depending on the local translucence value, you risk of having Down's baby changes. Then you have serum biomarkers, which were the mainstay until recently. You can do them in the first trimester, where you do serum-free beta-HCG, PAP-A, and 
local translucency as the first trimester case. Or in the second trimester, you can do serum beta HCG, alpha fetal protein, and serum unconjugated estriol, which is a, a metabolite of estradiol in the, the maternal serum. Depending on their values, you can predict whether the baby is having higher risk or lower risk of problems. So, those are the second trimester testing. Sometimes we offer them in stages. You do the first trimester screening and then you couple that with the second trimester screening. And in the second trimester, another additional testing which we will do is inhibit A. It's called dimeric inhibit A. And that also increases the accuracy. So, those are the serum biomarkers. Sometimes we call them analytes. Anything which is analyzed to assess this, the risk is called analyte. Then we uh, use mother's blood to go for cell free fetal DNA test. So, we identify the fetal DNA in the mother's blood. Those DNA are freely floating in the mother. They can be seen early from early part of the pregnancy until shortly after the delivery. They rapidly vanishes after a few hours from delivery. All cell-free DNA from the mother's blood will vanish. So we have we can identify them early. So those are the non-invasive tests which we have. we will go into detail in later part of the lecture. Then invasive diagnostic tests are done in different uh, patients in different ways. Say if you are having an IVF pregnancy, during the process of uh, in vitro culture of the blastocyst up to the blastocyst level, you can do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. You can take blastomias. Or you can say polar bodies of the zygote, which are just outside, uh, outside of the cell membrane, and identify genetic abnormalities because polar bodies have half of your genetic material. So biopsying them will give you a good idea. Plasmids will actually be a single cell which will have all the genetic information of another baby. So, having a blastomy biopsy will tell you whether the baby is going to have abnormality or not. In high risk situations, especially in older couples, these tests are offered and done in IVF centers. In good IVF center, there should be facility for pre implantation and genetic diagnosis. In Sri Lanka, also, we have one or two centers offering them. Then, to confirm the abnormal. Uh, occurrence of trisomy or any other genetic abnormality, we may have to take samples from the fetus. That is then mainly done by amniocentesis or corionicular sampling. You put a needle either into the amniotic cavity or you put a catheter through the cervix or abdominally to the placenta and take corionicular. Remember we are not directly taking the baby cells in this case. They are taking either amniotic cells or the cells flown away from the baby's skin and biopsy or fibroblasts from the skin. Amniotic uh, or chorionic villus uh, samples which have same similarity of genetic material to the baby will be sampled. But in the latter part of the pregnancy, we can even take directly biopsies from the baby, either through needle or fetoscopy or embryo fetoscopy. We can take fetal biopsies. We can take blood from the baby directly from the cord, cordocentesis. So, those are tests which we do to diagnose mostly genetic conditions or other structural abnormalities in the latter part of the pregnancy. They are not really part and parcel of prenatal diagnosis, which we discuss commonly, mainly targeting trisomy. 
for them it's serum testing and CVSO amniotic testing plus or minus ultrasound and cell free DNA. This fetoscopy is codocentesis, so tissue biopsies of the fetus are mainly for genetic abnormality diagnosis or structural abnormality diagnosis in latter part of the pregnancy. So, as I mentioned earlier, single screening tests, as one setting you offer the test and then you take the result and then counsel the patient. The are done starting from the first trimester. There are certain criteria which will allow us to do that. Usually, first trimester screening is offered between 10th week or 11th week up to the 14th week. And you do local transosis testing, serum free beta HCG, pregnancy associated placental protein A or plasma protein A, PAP A. Those three tests will be done and then you feed them with additional risk, uh, factor information, maternal age, previous annuality history, age, race, weight, number of fetuses are all given into a software and then you get the result and that will tell us whether the, the mother is having a higher risk or lower risk. I will show you a report from a first trimester screen. The nuclear translucency is the only component which is uh, not serum related in the first trimester screening. You need to do it by a specially trained uh, or validated accredited sonographer and it, if it is increased usually 2.7 or 3 millimeters or more uh, for that particular POA if it is increased you have a higher chance of having a trisomy. Apart from Down syndrome, you uh, risk of having structural cardiac abnormality or having a risk of uh, the vascular malformations of the baby is also increased. Apart from uh, aneuploidy risk, structural heart defect risk is very high because of that even if your Down syndrome risk becomes low after testing, Somebody with high nuclear translucency needs to be followed up, especially with the anomaly scan data in pregnancy around 18 to 24 weeks. Depending on your thickness or the nuclear translucency increment, your outcomes is going to be poor. So you need to have a trained sonographer. You do it around 9 to 13 week and Local translucency itself will predict or detection have a detection rate of about 70 percent, fairly high. This is the nuclear translucency. You measure the, this is the amnion, this is the baby's skin, outer border, this is the inner subcutaneous fascia level. So, you measure the subcutaneous fluid collection. In Down syndrome, there is a problem in developing the lymphatics. So, their skin is always oversized. So, it is more than their body size. So, there is a collection of fluid underneath the skin. That will be the one which we are after. So, here is a Down's baby with high nuclear transfusions. And obviously, at a higher risk. Even if other tests say that the Down's risk is low, you still will have risk of having other abnormalities, cardiac abnormalities. Oh, on the same slide, you can see nasal bone. Again, another soft marker. Nasal bone. Soft marker for. Down syndrome. If it is positive, present, your risk of Down syndrome is less. Now, this baby has this one doesn't. This is a scanning report of a patient uh, who has got Down syndrome screening. It was a IV pregnancy, so 
we couldn't uh, do a typical translucency, but we have done free beta HCG and fat values are given and the report comes as this. Now this is the patient's risk assessment after combining these two parameters and other risk factors. There's a mathematical model in the software, it will give you a calculation. It will plot that against the cutoff, which is roughly 1 in 200 or 1 in 300. So it will tell whether you are having a higher risk of trisomy 21. It is below the cutoff trisomy. So if it is above this, you are at high risk. If it is below this in green zone, you are good to go. Trisomy 13 and 18 risk again is lower. That is given here separately. So overall, this is a good outcome for this particular mother because mother is 41 years of age. So without this test, they will would have been in uh, enormous stress about the possibility of downs in their baby. After this testing, we can reassure them to a fair high extent and they really need you know, go for uh, any other testing in the second trimester and went on to deliver completely normal baby. So there are benefits of Down syndrome screening even as a screening test. There are other biomarkers apart from the first trimester biomarkers like alpha fetoprotein and serum trial. And alpha fetoprotein is important because it is not only a component of Down syndrome screening, it will increase in open neural tube defects in IUDs, in twin pregnancies and cases of gastrochysis. Wherever there is a breach of the skin, alpha fetoprotein risk is higher or internal structures which are open to the amniotic cavity will increase the alpha fetoprotein. So that will tell us whether the baby can have the open neural tube defect. So before high sensitive ultrasound is available, CRM alpha fetoprotein level used to give us an idea about neural tube defects as well. But nowadays it is no longer done to diagnose neural tube defects. It's mainly diagnosed easily even from the end of first trimester by a ultrasound scan. This tells us uh, how this common alpha beta protein is trial and CG markers change in the second half of the pregnancy or second trimester of the pregnancy. So you can see HCG goes down by 20 weeks, it's very low. Alpha beta protein continues to increase. And then each trial is very slowly increasing. So depending on their values, if HCG values are higher, alpha protein values are lower, that increases uh, the risk of Downs. Generally, in Downs babies, the alpha fetal protein is lower. HCG is higher, unconjugated Israel is low. So, E3 low, F low, HCG high. This is the common triple test which we have been doing, but nowadays getting out of fashion. It has 60 70 percent accuracy, which we will see, and was used mainly as the second trimester screening test, and after their positivity or high risk result, we offered amniocentesis. And other analytes like Inhibini had been added and then they we call it quadruple test. So and we can couple that with first trimester screening and then it is called integrated test. So there are various combinations, we will come into that later. 
then other conditions like multiple gestations, neural tube defects, gastrointestinal atresia, gastrochiasis, omphalocele, sacrococcygeal teratoma, fetal death, hemorrhage, infections, anything can increase alpha fetoprotein. So, alpha fetoprotein is a biomarker for multiple abnormalities. So, if it is high, you need to always. So, there are other side benefits of offering Down syndrome screening for these babies. The quadruple test which I mentioned earlier, you couple HCG alpha fetoprotein is trial with dimeric inhibitor. 70%, 80% in detection rate. And the only advantage is you do it in the second trimester, no ultrasound is needed in the first trimester. But suppose if it comes high risk, you need to rush for amniocentesis because after 18 weeks, 20 weeks, it's very difficult to, even if they want to terminate pregnancy. So because of that, we are now seeing a shift mainly towards first trimester screening and diagnosing abnormal babies as early as possible so that parents can have a fairly uncomplicated, easy termination. Though it is not practical in our country, you need to know that this is the way things are done in other countries. So, you sometimes we combine first trimester and second trimester testing, which we call integrated, integrated test. Here we, in the first trimester, we do nuclear transversus plus HCG and PAP, and then in the second trimester, we couple that with quadruple testing. It is the test, uh, the biochemical test, which has the highest detection rate, almost 96%. And it's the recommended testing method in most of the advanced countries. Uh, you can skip the nuclear transversus part where you don't need to do ultrasound. Then it is called the serum integrated testing. So integrated testing is the gold standard kind of a test which we can do. Then we have we can do them in se separate stages. You can do this first trimester screening, look at transversus and PEP and beta HCG, and then give the result. If it is high risk, you go for straight away go for CVS or coronary sampling or amniocentesis, or a liver test called for cell free fetal DNA can be open. And if it is negative, you don't do any more testing. If the risk is low, you don't, uh, you, the patients might go for second trimester quadruple testing. And then you can recalculate the risk and then again offer them amniocentesis or coordinate the sampling for confirmation or diagnosis. That is called the sequential test. And basically, you do tests in sequence. You do first test, offer the results, and then offer the second test, and then recalculate the risk, taking everything into it. Then there is another test uh, method. We don't do them mainly in America. They offer this contingent test. Again, the same thing. You do the first trimester screening test and first second trimester screening test separately. Instead of high risk or low risk uh, for Down syndrome, here you calculate the results as high risk, intermediate and lower risk. After the first trimester test, if your risk is lower, no test further. Don't. If they have intermediate risk, you go for second trimester screening. If they have high risk, like in the sequential testing, straight away you go for amniocentesis. So, in a way, this is easier and you have the ability to decide on termination if it is high risk, but if it is lower risk, you can decide whether to go forward with second trimester test or not. Cell-free fetal DNA is the newest kid on the block. 
we do uh, this test to identify fetal DNA in the mother's blood. Actually, these cells are not from the baby. They are from the trophoblast, which has higher chance of looking like the baby's cells. But remember, sometimes there can be two cell lines. Trophoblastic cell line may be a bit different from the baby's. That is called the mosaism. So many of us can have different cell lines in our body. So it is possible for us to have different genetic material in the same patient. So because of this mosaism risk, these tests are not 100% accurate. That is why they are still not diagnosed. This. But it is very ingenious because you, the theory behind that is that you take cells which are taken away after death of the cell from the trophoblasts which are released into the maternal villous environment and then they are taken into the maternal circulation. So the mother will carry the material from the dead fetal cells. And you can identify those fetal fragments and analyze them after doing PCR to enrich them. You can do various uh, kind of DNA uh, genetic testing. But the accuracy depends on whether you have higher percentage of fetal of blastic cells in the mother's serum. Obviously, that depends on the, the stage of the pregnancy. In the early pregnancy, you may not have enough cells uh, from the baby or the trophoblast exposed to the maternal cells. But towards the latter part of the pregnancy, you will have higher number of uh, fetal DNA because the exposure of the placental villi to the maternal blood is very high. So, generally, we aim to get at least 10% of the the available cell free fetal DNA from the baby. So that is usually occurring around 10th week of pregnancy. Remember, not only the baby, mother cells also will have their free cell free fetal DNA, uh, cell free DNA in the maternal serum. So you will still have maternal fraction and the baby's fraction. What we are going to uh, look for is whether the, the the combination of chromosomal material or DNA material from 21st chromosome is higher in the mother sample. Obviously, mother will have two to 21 chromosomes, but if the baby also has additional copy, the amount of chromosomal material from 20, 21st chromosome will be higher than expected in a normal patient. So that can be picked up. So this is how it is done. This slide tells you this is the trophoblast. So you have the sensitive trophoblast. Those cells die and they release cell free DNA. They are brought in the mother. This is maternal cell free DNA. The red in the blue. They are taken in the sample. They are amplified by various means. This is message parallel sequencing. There are certain other test uh, procedures which can be done. And then you can identify, take the, the genetic material and then see whether they have higher copy number of trisomy 21 related D, in fact, uh, DNA segments. In that case, you can tell there's a higher copy number of trisomy 21 related, related genes. Yeah, because of that, the baby is having there's a possibility of her carrying a trisomy 21. But this calculation is accurate only in single terms. If she has twin, then obviously the trisomy 21 dosage is high. So it is difficult. Then we need to go for a good old local translucency and ultrasound scanning to identify Down syndrome. So serum testing is tricky in multiple pregnancies overall in all patients. You need to keep that in mind. Since we have got hold of DNA material from the baby, apart from identifying trisomy, we can do other things as well. You can look for genetic diagnosis, see deletions, duplications like sickle cell, thalassemia, 
RH disease. You can see you can take the baby's blood group straight away from the mother's blood. You don't really need to do mother's blood, do screening, other things. In other countries now they don't really do uh, RH antibody screening. They do an unexpected antibodies, may not for RH, for other red cell isoimmunization, not for RH disease. If you can know the baby's genotype straight away from a mother's sample. You can identify other single gene disorders as well. So, maternal screen screening will lead us to a whole new world of single gene defect identification. You can see the, the, the total transcription noble genes of the baby. You can see the post translational modifications methylomes transcriptome. So, so, a lot of genetic testing can be done and identified. So, basically you can get a good genetic profile of the baby prior to its birth by looking at the maternal serum samples. Again, same thing explained in detail and this is a result of a NIPT test. It has calculated the dosage of chromosome 13 material, 18 material and 21 material and Y chromosome. So, this is a Y chromosome is detected. So, it is a boy. Other chromosomal aneuploidies are lower. You can easily say whether each chromosome number is increased or not. All you need to look at is a particular gene segment which is located in that chromosome. So, we know a particular characteristic segments of each chromosome and if the that segment is higher highly expressed in the mother sample that chromosome is expressed more than normal. So, you can easily calculate the risk. So, this lady has lower risk. She had a baby previously affected baby with trisomy 21. So, before the in the early part of the present pregnancy they wanted to know the possibility of this whether their baby is having high risk or not. So, this gave them good reaction. You can see here the chromos sex chromosomal aneuploidies, monosomies and monosomies. So, basically the whole chromosome segment is analyzed. Aneuploidies of all chromosomes can be seen. When you are looking at the result, the whole the most important thing is the amount of fetal fraction is now. Remember this non-invasive prenatal testing has to be done from 10th week or more because of the need for us to get high fetal DNA fraction. Do not think of doing it earlier. You need to do it after 10 weeks. Up to term you can do, but generally we do it early. So, 10th week, 11th week, 12th week, then you have enough time to do for see them additional backup screening or the anomaly scanning and then offering them uh, termination if they really want. We do not do them, but at least give them the option of going for termination. So, in this patient, the baby has given fairly high amount of DNA material and the mother's blood has large amount. Sometimes if the fetal fraction is less than 10 percent, they will ask the couple to come for another sample. So, for Down syndrome detection, this non-invasive prenatal testing has 98 percent or almost 99 percent accuracy because of mosaicism, multiple pregnancies, so having undiagnosed dead twin. Most of us do not know whether we are part of a twin pregnancy or not. The AI is a false positive. So, this test still is not offered as a diagnostic test. It is still a screening test. People are debating whether we can trust the genetics to diagnose. So, probably it will not resolve. So, it, but still even though it is a screening test, as a single test, it is expensive, but compared to the hassle of going through scanning and serum testing, this is much safer, straightforward, and it will give you additional information as well. So, 
people are now moving for these tests. But it is good for diagnosis of Down syndrome, but trisome 18 and 13 still detection rates are not that good. Still it is possible to tell, but they say the detection rates are not good. And if it is positive or high risk, again you need to still offer them amniocentesis or coronary stump. I told you why it is still possible for you to have false negative results. And when you are doing only non-invasive prenatal testing with self-repeated DNA, your chance of detecting alpha free protein rise with neural tube defect is not there. So might as well think of offering that ultrasound for. So to complete the aneuploidy screening, we need to go a little bit about ultrasounds role in aneuploidy screening like Down syndrome. Unlike other aneuploidies like trisomy 18 or Edward syndrome and Tabato syndrome, where you have marked major sub -abnorm structural abnormalities, Down syndrome does not have major structural abnormalities, at least in the early part of the brain. They will have cardiac abnormalities, duodenal adhesions in the latter part of the pregnancy. By that time, it is almost useless for prenatal diagnosis purposes. So, in first trimester, we are focusing on certain soft markers. In itself, they are not really indicating, but if they are occurring together, that might increase the risk of Down's baby slightly. In the second trimester, you can see it at Roger Fellows, VSD, AV canal defects. In atresia. They are in the second trimester. So the soft markers are, as I mentioned earlier, nasal bone, nuchal fold. It's not nuchal transverse. The nuchal fold it is done in the second trimester. With the whole thickness of the skin. Renal pelvic dilatation, seen like cogenic or white-like bubble, or short femur like in the latter part of the pregnancy. All these things are soft markers. In isolation, they don't mean anything, not significant. But if they say a cogenic bubble with absent nasal bone is a high risk for Down's. So you can't really assign significance to one particular thing. So if you see one, look for the others and always get a second opinion from another person. So this is the nasal bone which I have shown you earlier. Increasing local transversals. This is the local thickening, back of the neck, of the neck, ventricular dilatation, hypercogenic bubble, white like bone like bubble, pyrectasis or dilatation of renal pelvis, intracardiac focuses, short limbs, all these things are soft markers of Down syndrome. After Screening test. You need to go for invasive testing or diagnostic test. So far, we have gone into detail to see how they are screened. The aim of a diagnostic testing is to identify those who are positive with screening test whether they are having a real abdominal or confirmatory test. Now we come to invasive pseudo diagnostic uh, testing. The invasive test I mentioned earlier in IVF is pre-implantation diagnosis which we can do in a polar body or in the blastocyst or blastomere. And even from trophoectoder in the blastocyst, you can take samples and then come to the conclusion about the baby. And if they are positive, still you can identify Down syndrome and other abnormalities, but still, usually, we wait until uh, first trimester, end of the first trimester, to do amniocentesis or corinuclear sample to confirm abdominality. Corinuclear sampling is done 
between 10 to 13 weeks usually you can do it even after but usually done early uh, part of the pregnancy so it is the method of choice in early part of pregnancy to confirm the down syndrome amniocentesis is not done in early part of the pregnancy in the especially in the first trimester or early second trimester because of the risk of uh, uh, miscarriage as well as development of amniotic bands in the baby so early amniocentesis is not offered it is generally reserved after 16 weeks or later in the pregnancy the idea you have a lot of amniotic fluid you can take it easy this is done the cervical, uh, cer chronic venous sampling is done trans cervically or trans abdominally i will post a video link on this otherwise it will uh, lengthen the presentation you can look at the video link and see how it is done basically you put a catheter through the cervix and navigate it into the placental bed and take a small sample by aspiration. It gives the results quickly compared to an amniotic cell which needs culture for 21 days to come to a karyotyping. You can do fish testing very early with amniotic fluid but still to confirm the culture has to happen. Here you can do 5 to 7 days compared to amniotic there is slightly higher miscarriage rate compared to amniocentesis which has 1 in 200 here, 1 in 100. Even in best of hands, the risk of when you meddle around with uh, placenta surface, you have higher risk. Spotting, occasional culture failures, amniotic fluid leakage compared to amniocentesis is less but still possible. As I mentioned, amniocentesis is done after 15 weeks, even up term you can do it. You can do it under ultrasound guidance, even CVS we do under ultrasound guidance. Depending on the POA, you take about 20 to 30 ml of amniotic. If the woman is Rh negative, even after coronary sampling or amniocentesis, you need to arrange anti D. Risk of miscarriage is less. Spotting, risk of premature rupture. Occasionally, there may be needle injury, very rare with ultrasound monitoring, and culture failure of amniotic cells. I will post another video link for you to watch in this. This is the general idea of amniotic amniocentesis. It's not um, rocket science. You put a spinal needle after giving some local anesthesia, like when we having polyhydramnios, we need to tap the uh, uh, amniotic fluid to, to relieve the pain. You do it in early pregnancy, slightly early pregnancy in the same way, nothing much. You have a needle guide to avoid, so the needle tip is here. You make sure that the tip is within the guide. Fetal blood sampling is done with, a, you can do it with a spinal needle or you can do it with fetoscope. Uh, and usually after 20 weeks because before that it is not possible you can take it from the placental insertion because you can't take the umbilical insertion point where the baby always keep on moving so the safest place to do the fetal blood sampling from the cord is the placental insertion point you take up to about 4 ml and usually it is done in RH disease or any other genetic condition. There is obviously a risk of miscarriage because of the messing around with the baby. Again, there is a video. I will put a video link for this. Otherwise, it will prolong the presentation. You can do under the same uh, principle, you can do uh, biopsies on, by putting a fetoscope into the abdomen and take some samples from the fetus. Especially various genetic conditions on the skin, you may be able to do this. Sometimes, apart from taking the biopsy, we might just observe 
and then do various uh, laser procedures. And usually these are done after 12th week, up to term you can do them. Uh, and most of the time it allows us to take biopsies and treat them, especially uh, separating amniotic bands, treating uh, with various glue-like materials of rupturing of membranes and sometimes you can treat the babies with uh, who are having congenital diaphragmatic hernias by tracheal occlusion, laser ablation of sacrococcygeal teratomas, chorioangiogram treatments and even uh, repair of meningomyelosin. So, fetoscopy is done in fetal medicine centers in developed countries. Uh, with fetoscope, you can treat twin to twin transfusion syndrome in monochorionic twins, about 15% of them will have. Basically, there is a link of the blood supplies of both twins, and you can ablate with a laser beam block off all the blood. And after all these invasive procedures, amniocentesis, chorionicular sampling or uh, fetal blood samplings, you need to take the material to the lab. So, if your aim is for prenatal diagnosis of uh, aneuploidy, you need to send them across to the lab for various tests. The, the commonest thing is conventional karyotype. It takes about two weeks to get the report. You can detect abnormalities. It's the standard traditional method. To diagnose Downs, you can do fish or fluorescent inside to hybridization. Within 48 hours, you can get the report. It is limited to common major aneuploidies like 13, 18, 21, X and Y. So, whether you are having a, a Turner or Downs or Edwards, you can easily see. It's not that accurate, less accurate. So, you need to always back up with the karyotype. You can do fish on cultured uh, amniotic cells and that allows us to see various micro deletions and duplications so other genetic abnormalities like various uh, thalassemias or uh, sickle cell anemias can be picked up or in various other um, genetic single gene disorders can be identified. You have chromosomal microarrays which can be done. And you can do with pre implantation genetic diagnosis, which I mentioned, or you can do various DNA testings. You can even go up to the level of identifying single gene mutations. Takes about 14 days, but still gives almost all the results. So you need to know identify abnormalities in karyogram or karyotype picture. This is a trisomy. Sometimes you might see translocations, you can see single legs in a turnus, and then interpret that, and then you need to answer or counsel the patient. Most of the time, it's given as a live patient. This is a fish testing for trisomy 21, so uh, flu, high, uh, antibody is uh, probably is targeted towards trisomy uh, 21st chromosome, and in this patient's cells, you have three chromosomes. This is a PCR result and it is the basis of almost all, everything which we do with genetic material these days. So it is better for you to be familiar with molecular testing or tests in medicine because in future medicine is going to be mainly in this area. Right, so we have come to the end of lecture 2. If you have any further queries, please raise them in the forums.